If you hear the sound of my guitar and the sound of my voice, you rest assured you are listening to Re and Co Radio. Today we have a very, very special show lined up for y'all. We have uh, a person who has left an immense impression on me, an artist with which his way of seeing the world and the way that he acts and, and the way that he artists um, has really changed my opinion of what a, an artist is capable of. Today in the room we have Raghava KK, but also we have his brother Kartik. And Kartik is a person which I've tried to describe, but I found it very, very difficult. He's a person who makes sense of the world through mathematical analysis. He's a person who is very deep into uh, investigative, I would say, um, kind of understanding. And so what we have on the one hand is the left side of the brain, a person who is very artistic, and we also have the right side of the brain, a person who's very good analysis. And believe me, it will be a very pleasant conversation for us all. Also with us in the room is Amanda Joy Ravenhill from the Buckminster Fuller Institute and the amazing Turquoise. Now, Turquoise is also a person who matches artistry very beautifully with her intellectual insight. So what we're going to do today, and just to frame this conversation, uh, reminding everybody that the theme is re-artistry, and co-inspiration and the purpose of this whole conversation this exchange is to really try to understand what the role of the artist is in modern society in the 21st century what it means to be an artist in the 21st century and try to understand the impact that the artist can have at this pivotal moment of time when transformation into something other is so 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 important So that's a cue. Who wants to jump at it? <laughs> I'll jump uh, since everyone else is so shy. Uh, I mean, it's it's very fascinating that you said um, th- that we are in a transform- transformative mo- moment. I think Raghava and I have talked a lot about how there are these two sort of looming things that seem to affect all of humanity two issues maybe 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 more but the two that we can see more clearly is um, the rise of ai in the nation the threat of job displacement the threat of just entering a completely new society really in threat and promise um and the other issue of course being the climate and um what's interesting the way you phrase it is i think the past 50 60 years art history art art history art after the after the after the the disaster of the world war 2 especially has sort of entered into a phase when it's mostly looking at the past or the present mostly looking at uh, cultural criticism or um, nostalgias or anti nostalgias of the past but of course there is there are, there were moments in art history where art has played this role of actively trying to build the future and those have been moments for example um you know in the russian revolution you had all these artists before of course the rise of stalin who played a pivotal role in trying to imagine and build this beautiful this society that they thought they were building this new society so the question is how much the question that i guess i have for the other people is this how much of a role in the art play in the social imaginary in in imagining the future rather than just reacting to the past or the present mm, i love that mm. and the word and the root of image within that right to to bring into image to bring into sight to bring into vision that which is possible and when we're in this moment of everyone competing it's like what degree of apocalypse is the future going to be you know how how awful could it get uh seems to be the conversation in the media you know i did an analysis several years ago around climate communication climate news and at that time it was 86% of the news around climate was around the future that we don't want to live into and so no wonder people don't want to talk about climate change one it's a hybrid object anyway but two you know if we're always being told that it's going to be awful 
we're not going to want to deal with it. Uh, but now there's so much wonderful work being done, including the Design Science Studio at Buckminster Fuller Institute, of inviting artists to imagine that future that we do want to be in. Um, and I think it's, it's one of the great cheat codes of our time right now is empowering artists who are system thinkers, right? They, they work across disciplines. They're able to see that those transdisciplinary principles, you know, and apply principles of ballet to architecture or whatever it may be. Um, and that, you know, what Buckminster Fuller called the comprehensivist view is so critical to be able to design a future that, you know, really really goes through what is needed right now of, of true systems change so yeah would love to hear what others think of of like artists as systems change agents artists as systems thinkers uh, and how we can appreciate them more for that man it's so beautiful Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you, we are live on KPCR FM 101.9 in Santa Cruz. We are also in Clubhouse. If you're listening to us on Instagram, you can come to the Clubhouse room. We're going to be taking questions later on. And it's very nice just to be in a space where people are talking to one another, especially on a theme which is so important as this. And I really love Kartik, you know, the way that you brought up that, that just that idea that we're between promise and... Um, what was that other word you were you, you used? It was it was promise and uh, remind me, remind me, remind me. And threat. I think I said threat. Yeah, between threat and promise, between a nightmare and a beautiful dream, and it's like as if our imaginative, creative powers are the ones which are supposed to gr- guide us and create that vision. And clearly, you know, when we speak to people who are in deep in sustainability, what we notice is that uh, sustainability is very much based in science. And science is very much about describing things. But what we need now is radical envisioning, a little bit more kind of like ambitious, uninhibited dreaming. And so we find that that the artist's role is, uh, I would like, at least like to think it's very important. If I can jump in a little. And you know, Karthik and I were both heartbroken a couple of years ago. And we landed up in India and we wrote this thesis called Transcendence for the Post-Human Age. What is that object that inspires us to grow, to go beyond who we are, into who we can be? And while doing research on that, Karthik and I came across three emotions that are critical for any sort of transcendence or growth loss, liberation, and mystery. You know, when I went through divorce, a part of me died. And loss brought up anger, insecurity, defensiveness, self-judgment, all these emotions associated with loss, aversion, and loss. When we barely experience or give ourselves time to acknowledge the second emotion, which is, I can be anything, I can be anybody, I can date anybody, I can do whatever I want now that I'm free. And that's liberation. And the third is actually the most underexplored, which is, I have no clue who I will become to truly embrace surprise, to truly embrace mystery. And so when you have all these three emotions associated with growth, it's important that we focus on all of them, the threat, the liberation, the promise, and the fact that we can never know who we are going to become. Absolutely responsible to what Amanda said and talk about it. Um, I mean, first st- starting backwards, um, what Raghav was just speaking about is really a very famous theory of not the, of, not of religion or of spirituality as defined as a certain set of dogmas, but rather of the experience of what we can call the numinous, that which takes us beyond ourselves, of, of transcendence really. And it was uh, this famous uh, sort of description of the numinous 
as mysterium tremendum et fascinans that is mystery that's both tremendous it awes you and yet fascinates you what repels you and pulls you forward that we really really identify with so many experiences and then sort of go back a little bit and connect back with what Amanda was saying i think absolutely i think um i think for artists to really engage in uh politics for example or um, amanda mentioned ballet and industrial engineering why not uh, what we really need also then is an expansion of the idea of what art can be because i think we've gotten a little too used to the idea that art is this 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 this, this genre rather than that fundamental exercise of creativity in the face of constraints uh, rather than um understanding and realizing that when i write about a causality in statistics with uh, with my co-authors that i'm 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 an artist um i mean i'm i'm not saying that as any kind of um uh, or oh, everything ev- every creative endeavor is is art but there there are situations where you're faced with problems where you do not have uh logical solutions to that you kind of have to improvise and you kind of have to um be alive to that moment and and i think we need to ex- the reason i keep saying i think the reason i kept the reason i said that i think we need to expand our idea of what art is is once we ghettoize art once we say oh artists are people who create music artists are people who uh paint then we've immediately sort of confined their potential to be um parts of 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 parts of society i mean the P- percy byshe shelley used to say artists are the legislators of human kind i think that's a little bit um little bit ambitious uh no such thing but what he really meant was coming up with the myths that move coming up with the stories that connect coming up with the imagination of what the future can be i think all of this is a vital component of art um i don't i don't know what you guys think but i was sort of just responding to what uh, amanda and rago were talking about yeah that's beautiful what you were saying and i have to agree with you in the sense that at least the way i understand it is that we take art as creativity that can be put into a discipline though creativity is much freer like right now i'm using music but i'm not playing a song i'm just messing around and i definitely agree with you on that but i wonder you know i'm very curious what do ragav or turquoise make of that I was waiting to hear the beautiful turquoise. Okay, so Karthik, um in response to you, you know yesterday we had a beautiful conversation about the source of that creative impulse. Right? When you wrote that paper with Guido, I would love for you to tell us about that and just where did the idea for that come from? who do you attribute credit to for such a breakthrough could you just remember we had this beautiful conversation about the origin of that creative impulse is that god is that higher than the self where does i know that i did not create my orgasm project i know that i was merely a vehicle of intention i held the integrity of that encounter but i can't take credit for having imagined or created the orgasm project i'd love to hear talk or say something but if if she doesn't i will come in and i'll add it in a minute turquoise okay go ahead kartik you go ahead <laughs> <laughs> Uh no I mean I think uh, more to the point I think uh, I mean I, there's two things I think I want to say in response to that Raghava one is I think we should talk about the very very and, and you are much better at talking about this because you've thought about it more about the very strange process we had when we engaged with each other and 
um, creating your series edges um, Raghava Bey basically uh, to those who don't know he is an artist he's worked with multimedia he's done crazy things um, but we had this very intense moment as soon as the pandemic broke out when we engaged with each other in, and, and all I was trying to do I mean to, to use a very fanciful metaphor Socrates says that he doesn't know truth he's just the mid wife of truth um, in, in Plato so he just sort of questions other people till the truth comes out of them um, so since the the, the 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 theme of today is co-inspiration and co-creation um, what really what what happened at that moment was that Raghava mentioned that we had both come through divorces we were on if we were both in a shattered state and what was really really mysterious was how we were able to help each other achieve the Um, a potential sounds a bit of bit, bit cliche but really feel the energy that's within us express itself through uh, our thoughts our words our actions and um, would love to hear your thoughts on that first but a very quick response I mean it's fascinating where creativity comes from and different cultures have had such di- different ideas if you go back to the Greeks they thought literally creative creativity was the spirit that entered you from from outside that's literally what inspiration means inspiration means in breathing or the spirit coming in um, so uh, there were the muses the muses who the patrons of the various arts that created different sorts of inspirations as the Sufis for example believe that um, there are three levels of reality one is the ilmal shahada which is the manifest world the world that we live in the world we breathe in the world we see things in the other being the other are the other opposite pole being the world of the intellectual reality so for every beautiful thing there is an idea of beauty and we recognize a beautiful thing because beauty exists in this intellectual world um, and it's called that ilmal ghaib um, that's kind of like the world of platonic forms and in between other is the world of uh, visioning of visions of imagination and it's called ilm al-mithal which literally means the world of parables and it's the world of imagination that they claim we go we travel into every time we have a veridical dream a, a, a true dream or uh, or uh, a vision or we make a creative breakthrough and they believe we actually go there and come back down through a process of of ascent and descent called Fanan Bakha. Um, and I find that fascinating idea. Really, why do I find it fascinating? Not just because it's theoretical, but because I think as Raghava expressed, ultimately, if you really focus on the moments, you're being truly creative. You don't really know where it comes from. Um, I don't know if you guys have responses to either of the two, two thoughts. One about the Sufi idea of, of creation as being basically unveiling or kashf. Or the, the, other, the other thought, I mean, I really think Raghava should talk about this very weird co-creation process that happened. Thank you so much for sharing that, Karthik. But I'm going to wait for Amanda Turquoise. and Mark and the other beautiful people here to respond. And then we can go into that journey where you and I would fight. You know, the funny thing is Karthik and I are opposites in many ways. And the two of us have had periods in our life where we got along and there are times when we never got along. We didn't want to see each other. It was so funny that we had to be broken to really help see the magic in each other. I knew he was magical and special. I just know it. And he did the same of me. And we were able to pull out simultaneously the genie in each one of us. Or the spirit. So, other than making this a love fest, I do want to disagree also <laughs> with you. It would be lovely for us to, to give an example of how we push each other. We are so different. And there were times, I see Harshith is in the audience here. He has paid witness to us fighting, not talking, having existential problems with each other. But we end up coming back. We keep coming back to each other. So, anyone else has experienced this? 
Yeah, well, you know there are several There's several things emerging right there And I think one of them, the most interesting ones for me Is when we understand that creativity doesn't just It doesn't belong to us It's, it's uh, like, I don't think Kartik uh, I think you said the, the example of inspiration is very beautiful In the sense that it's something that is being channeled or we are inspired that there is something we are being incepted with that is guiding us and we have had some really curious conversations here when it comes to consciousness like for example there was this uh, one saying we had on the show this one phrase that emerged where somebody said that you don't know if you're playing music or the music is playing you where you don't know if you are reciting poetry or the poetry is reciting you and when we talked a little bit about the platonic, uh, you know, platonic uh, figures, the platonic solids, when we were talking a little bit even about Aristotle and the idea, the power of an idea, you kind of start thinking that there are thoughts, there are intentions that are timeless, um, that are even that are even without identity, without consciousness. They just kind of permeate. There's like. Um, and perhaps what is keeping us from actually exploring this theme of creativity in a constructive manner is ego to feel that we need to possess it that this is my work of art that this is my idea that this was you know my fantastic way of looking at the universe which changed everybody's lives so i would think yeah i agree with what you guys are saying but then my question is do you think that there's something to do with our ego or our um I don't know, with our idealization of being egocentric that is kind of putting us at odds with the creativity that we need to see in the world today. Mm. What that brings up for me is just the, the fallacy of the kind of lone genius, you know, and being of Buckminster Fuller's legacy, we fight with it all the time, but he was at the center of many different collectives. You know, and so much of what he's known for, the geodesic dome, tensegrity, were really products of a group of people. Um, and that collective also being nature, human and nature interaction. Am I planting the potato? Is the potato having me plant it? Mm. Am I planting the tree or is the tree, you know, incepting me to, to want to plant it? Um, and I think that, you know, that connection with nature um, is something that Buckminster Fuller was so good at. And I think he got kind of confused as like, these are his ideas, when really he was just completely devoted to seeing how nature's principles could be, you know, imbued in artifacts. And yeah, I think that's the great work of our time is to you know, terraform the planet and not just building soil, but you know, kind of rebuilding our connection and interdependence and awareness of our ourselves as nature. You know, this reminds me, Karthik, of the uh, responding to Amanda. You know, uh, I completely agree. Karthik can come up with this idea called the socius. Karthik, can you talk a little bit about that? Remember, I was very excited by that idea when it came up in conversation. The genius versus the socius. It's funny. I mean, this is it's, it's, it's a, a, a very idea. I think it's, it's not an idea that I came up with. That it is part of, I think, the collective consciousness of today. Just like Amanda mentioned, this idea of this lone wolf, sort of, uh, you know, creating, or like Junji said. Um, the idea that creativity belongs to us, that it is something that we exercise on the world. Like, it's this idea, it's this religious idea of creatio et nihilo. I mean, you create out of nothing. You create out of your own On the other hand, there's this idea um, that creativity happens to us. And so one of the, one of the points, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the, one of the, if you really look at history, if you look at, these moments of intense creative activity, like for example, if you look at in poetry, if you look at the romantic tradition in England and the magical period between 1790 and 1830, where in quick succession you had Keats, you had Byron, you had Shelley, you had um, Blake, you had Wordsworth, you had Coleridge, sort of feeding off each other uh, to create a magically new body of poetry. 
um, when you start looking at movements, movements don't just happen because we are herd creatures. Movements happen because there might be, as Amanda was suggesting, I think, an aspect of our creativity that is ineluctably social, that we, do, we, we feed off each other in some sense to keep raising each other uh, each other above. So I, one of the conversations with Raghav, I was just saying, we shouldn't have this concept of genius. I mean, there, the, I mean of course, the, 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 the universe, God, I would say God because I'm a believer, um, but whatever word you have for the ultimate, they call it truth, al-haq, or whatever, is channeled um, through certain people, through certain vessels. It cannot be otherwise. Um, but the fact is so many complex causes go into that channel, which includes interaction, which includes uh, being moments of openness to this, to being inspired, to, as Jyoti said, being open to the fact that creativity comes to you. And and I think um, I want to connect that with the idea of prayer. For me, prayer really is openness to this aspect of existence. A prayer is not asking some supernatural enti- entity, at least for me, uh, give me this or give me that. It's just being open to the fact that you are not your own self. I mean, that you don't own yourself, that you are a vessel and that you want to um, whether you want to call it truth, reality, um, God, whatever you want to call it, whatever ultimate term, that you are a vessel for that truth to express itself and express its glory. Uh, I know I'm using very religious words, but I'm using them metaphorically. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very much sort of echoing with uh, with with with, the, with, the, with what others are saying. And uh, I don't know, um, what do you guys think? Uh, about prayer, for example, and its relationship to me, it's the same. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the bottom of the hour. We are at the bottom of the hour. That's right. It's a great opportunity to indulge in a little bit of synthesis. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are listening to us right now, you are tuned into Reinco Radio. On KPCR FM 101.9 in Santa Cruz and Southern Silicon Valley. We have today on the show Raghava KK and his brother Kartik, and we are discussing re artistry and co inspiration. And we have reached a milestone in this lovely conversation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Beautiful people on the stage, we are indulging in the concept of the socius rather than the genius. The socius? The sociumus. Also known as the senius. Brian Eno's word for it. The senius. The genius of the scene. The genius of the scene. He's like a DJ knowing what to spin for his friends. He's connected and everybody's connected. I think that's curious. I mean, I've heard so many artists who weren't really artists at all in terms of kind of like uh, knowing how to weave uh, words with with a typewriter or to create beautiful tapestries or to paint or even to sing to save their lives. But what they knew was how to tap into the zeitgeist and the feeling of human beings and actually transcend their own egos, I think, in a sense, to connect with something um, much deeper, which is goes beyond um, individual aspirations. So I would like to invite you to do a synthesis on this. Can we get the lovely, can we get the lovely Amanda to comment on the synthesis a bit more? I find it curious and alluring. The curious, the curious genius, the cultural scene, the genius of the cultural scene. The cultural scene. Raghava, do you sing? Absolutely not. I just cannot sing with you. You are too good for this, my friend. I love how you just proved yourself wrong. I'm wondering if we could get the academic to prove us all wrong by singing along. 
Karti, can we hear a beautiful synthesis idea from you? Is it possible to do? Kartik must be very hesitant. I mean, Kartik, guys, let's give Kartik a big woo woo. I sing, and with that, I end my synthesis. We didn't hear you right. You're gonna have to repeat it. We're gonna have to get two bars of your synthesis. Sing in Arabic. Sing in Tamil. Ayo, ide yena graha charam. I am a part of the yada. I am a part of the yada. I am a part of the yada. Is that a prayer by any chance? Or is that a childhood song? Bring us into context. <laughs> oh gosh, I, can, I cannot do this. The, the singing, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. It's okay. You know, the funny thing is that I personally love just to hear people talk and speak because there's, there's, people don't realize it, but、um, we sing all the time.、Uh, what we do often is that、uh, the way that we speak, it has a certain melodic pattern. There's something called cadence as well, which is how when we finish,、um, uh, when we finish a sentence, you'll know it's, it's done just by the way that we lower the notes towards the end of what we've said. So, we're singing all the time, we don't realize it. And I try to tell people that, that you don't need to go to a karaoke to prove anybody anything. But unfortunately, when people go to karaoke, they go pick、uh, Freddie Mercury songs, right? And,、uh, and they absolutely murder and butcher it. And then they say, I can't sing to save my life. It's kind of like if somebody said,、um, Do you do sports? And I said, Sure. Well, all right, now go do an Ironman, Ironman contest right now. And you realize that you have a lot of work to do, but then you deny actually the beauty of just simple movement or just running or I don't know, you know, swimming, something like that. Does that make sense? Again, I think that ties in very beautifully to the whole thing with, you know, how we're putting artistry in certain. In certain k i n d of boxes, and that it's not allowed to do its thing because you're demanded to perform. And so, let me ask, let me ask you、uh, a question, guys. Let me ask you guys a question.、Um, Raghava, you right now have just auctioned off at Sotheby's a、uh, uh, very interesting work of art where you have digitally. And mapped an orgasm. You've mapped several orgasms. And you had this very deep question with your brother concerning whether it's even ethical to sell an orgasm. So now let me ask you guys something simple like you've discussed this. Do you think that our society and that our, I don't know, socioeconomical paradigms is actually hindering the artistic evolution that we need? Or is it just naturally something that you know, artists have to overcome on their own to bring something new about? I really don't think in terms of universal ethics. I think in terms of personal ethics. What is the world I want to live in? What are the boundaries of my experimentation? Just because I can do something, should I do it? Just because something is offered to me, do I engage with it? And I think it's really important for us to have ethical boundaries for ourselves. And the objective of this work was to ask humanity now that we are able to digitize everything in the world, the most non fungible entity in the world is you, is me. Should I also be a commodity? Should I also be for sale? And so I took the most personal of my human experiences, my orgasm, and by masturbating, it becomes self ironic. And I love anything that's self ironic when you have to make love to the other, being yourself. It's, it's a mindfuck. And I thought we can ask the world is this what makes sense? Do you want to digitize everything and commodify it? And I just wanted, I think art asks more questions than it can answer. And I think it's really up to us as artists to decide where our boundaries lie, where our ethical values lie. And I strongly urge 
all artists to find their space, their boundaries, not some universal accepted truth. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, that that is that is a good question. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you that the the word that the the obscene word that you may have heard escaping Ragavas on lips is, is an artistic thing. So don't be don't be too concerned. It's it's not. It was used as is the name of, of this artistic thing. So so don't worry about it. Um, we just have to say because we're in the air in the United States, and some people might take it. Oh, offense. I apologize. No, it's I okay. Apologize. It's okay. Somebody else will pay for the it's fine. It's meant only as a provocation. <laughs> no, no. But listen, it's it's a great provocation. I mean, that is the question. Um, I I for a period of my life, I stopped making music commercially because I thought that there were things that are priceless, and that the moment that you start commodifying things that should be priceless, um, you you become cynical, and it's it's very beautiful. I think uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, quote, which says that a cynic is a person who knows the price of everything but doesn't understand the value of them and 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 that is i think very very well described where we're at but i maybe let's get somebody else's opinion on this turquoise kartik what do you think about that you know the tension um you know the tension between the artist and the economic space is it just something that defines his art forms or something that he should fight against is it natural that there's that sense of tensegrity there or is it just uh is it just um not 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 beneficial for that artistic development guys okay, i'll jump in uh, yeah i mean i i think um it actually goes back to what Amanda was saying and what I was saying in, 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 in our own in my own groping way, which is uh, I think we should stop thinking about art as some sort of gesture of genius made by an individual um, exploring frontiers that other people cannot even dream of. Um, I think once you get into that, once you get into that mindset, that romantic mindset of the lone genius. Um, then yes, then any kind of social constraint is bad. Any kind of uh, any kind of ways in which the economic situation limits you is bad. Any kind of institution is bad. But but really, art is not made alone. Art can if there is no audience for art, there is no art. So I think um, I actually would say constraints are good. If the economic constraints, if there are economic constraints that hinder you, then work against them. You sometimes only express the universe or express yourself by fighting against barriers, by fighting against things that hinder you. Um, look at the incredible, incredible genius of um, the people who worked uh, in the post-Stalin era in Russia. Now, again, maybe too much constraint in society can also cr- kill creativity because we just have to look at the horrible films that came out of Russia during the, the Stalin during the Stalin years. But as soon as that, uh, as uh, during the Khrushchev years, during the the late years, some of the most beautiful films came out, and they could not be open. They could not. They were all censored, so they had to find other languages to express themselves. They sort of had to be crypto subversive. They have to be subversive, um, and you had this incredible um, films that were sly, ironic, but you had to be tuned into them to realize their creativity. So I, I, I don't think per per se constraint is bad. On the other hand, I also do agree that there is a social problem where we don't appreciate the value of the gift, um, where so much of creativity is a gift to us that we should also we should also think about um, the fact that maybe some of our art also needs to be a gift, um, just by the fact that um, we are not we don't decide to become artists. We we are you know we are we are we are. Uh, we, are, we talked about inspiration. We talked about the seniors, I guess. Um, sorry, we had our own word for it. Um, and we talked about all these other things. Um, what, what, what they really mean is you don't necessarily own the product of your work fully. And one way to acknowledge that is to really think about some of your art, at least, as a gift to the world. I think Jurgis was saying some, something similar. 
Um, what, what do you think, Amanda? I mean, what what, mm. what is, is this? Yeah, it's bringing to mind for me just the the great paradigmatic, you know, moment, the shift that we're in from the zero sum game at which one profit at another's expense, the extractive, exploitative economy towards the more shared value, you know, there's enough for us to all survive and even thrive. Um, And so the economies are shifting. And I, I wonder if the kind of, you know, cult of personality and the lone genius narratives are actually just a vestige of that old way of of thinking um, and that old way of running our economy and you know we're in an emergency ecologically in social justice in inequity you know that we've never seen wealth inequality like this ever in the history of, of history and so how can we use all of this art the seniors to do the culture jamming that's required for us to reinvent things very quickly. Like we're on the brinks, brink of collapse in so many different areas. And also do all that while keeping in mind the stress productivity curve. Like if we're too stressed out, our productivity goes way down. And so how do we hold this emergency and this opportunity in that in that peak inspiration moment of the curve, right? Where it's the more stress you have, it, you know, has increasing returns up to a point and then diminishing returns after a while so kind of bringing us back to the inspiration and that need to like <clears throat> dance in the in the paradigm shift um so yeah that's what it, that's what's all coming to mind for me and and this this turn between the extractive extractive towards regenerative economies and yeah how can we redefine the importance of artistry in that what does that look like for the economy of artists? And how can we make some NFTs about it? <laughs> no, you brought it up. You brought it up. I thought that's exactly where we had to go. Because when we talk about NFTs, and if we really want to unlock collaboration, and if what we're really looking for is to have art that is happening not just from one person, that not just emanates in its entirety from a small group of human beings or from a, an enterprise or an entrepreneurial point of view, but something that you know uh, invites people to be, you know, to, to to remix, to create derivative works and things like that. Well, then the NFT is supposed to solve that. But I don't know, Kartik or Ragava, what do you think about those NFTs or turquoise? You've seen that mostly what we're using them for is just to collect and use them the way that we used to use other high art forms. So the question is... So I both agree and disagree with Amanda and Karthik and all of you because for me as an artist it's neither the individual nor the socius or seniors or whatever you want to call it it is that dance as Amanda said between the two I would caution us from being so so one sided about this I don't want to fight the ego the ego is beautiful I don't like this dividing of the two i think it's the movement between the two i for me art has six things that it needs to satisfy for me to be excited about it one it has Wait, to be less exclusive ragava ragava let's do it like this we're going to we're going to yell one two three four five six and you're going to and you're going to say them all right just to, just to make it a little bit okay. more fun like a sesame okay. street thing ready here we go uh uh Done. one Exclusive to inclusive. Very, very good. Exclusive to inclusive. Go to hopeless to hopeful. That's beautiful. All right, now give me number three. Causing anxiety to healing. Anxiety to healing. Give me number four. Backward facing to future facing. Future facing. Yeah. Future facing. Five. Academic to relevant. Ooh, that sounded Academic. like a burn. Academic to, to relevant. relevant. To rel, 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 relevant. Give me six. 
a commodity to a way of life. From a commodity to a way of life. From a commodity to a way of life. Amanda, that sounds like something you would have said, right? True, true. It also sounds like the Tao. Ancient, ancient wisdom relevant to future, future. A way of life, a way of life, a way of... I think, you know, that's so beautiful. What we need right now is a guitar solo. Turquoise, you going to grace us with one of your guitar solos? I love these rooms. I think I think everything I've heard from Raghava, Kartik, Amanda, and Turquoise, it should be gospel. People should repeat it every Sunday. And I think it's just because it kind of adds perspective. When you're lost in the menial tasks of the everyday life, you sometimes really forget that there's a deeper way of looking at things. And so I'm tremendously thankful that we have this opportunity to be together. And just that massage each other's each other's um, minds with these beautiful um, I don't know words concepts ideas ladies and gentlemen this is Rianco Radio you are listening to us live on KPCR FM 101.9 you might also be hearing us here on the clubhouse room or on Instagram or on Facebook keep in mind that we meet every Wednesday 9 a.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. GMT, to share regenerative ideas and just to make music together in the process. So um, before we move into the final stretch, the final leg, may I ask everybody here with us today, is there something you feel that still needs to be said? Well, I've been holding my breath as I listen to these words of wisdom. And one of the things that comes to mind that came out of the collaboration in the Design Science Studio with Amanda and many others was that art, A-R-T, art is about regenerative thought. Art is about regenerative thought. We build upon each other's ideas and carry them forward. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. is about regenerative thought and if you think about it in a sense art is regenerative if it goes through creativity it's something that springs from the deepest wells of our souls and uh, I think it doesn't expire which is a good question Raghava what do you think that age I mean you've been making art forever and ever you're considered an artistic veteran in India but you're not you're not that old either so tell me how you feel that the years have changed your perspective to art and your role in society. Wow, that's a, an interesting question. You know, it's gone a whole s- circle. You know, it started off by trying to participate, trying to fit in. Initially, it's a, it's a stroke of, of surprise that you can create art. Then you try to fit in and then you try to separate yourself and then you don't give a, a damn <laughs> after some point <laughs> and for me art I will leave you with one thought I was I met this gentleman who had come from a concentration camp who had survived a concentration camp and he said every day we were stripped naked and kept outside and we were whipped if he moved so there was no reason to live but I asked God every day, show me one sign to live another day. And he said, every day, he either saw a feather fall from the sky, and he said, that's my sign. 
or he saw the light between the trees and he said that's my sign for me that is art it has no truth in itself it has no ultimate promise it evokes it connects it inspires it gives hope for me that is art i don't take myself that seriously at the same time i take my own ethics and my life seriously so i don't know what art means to culturally historically but personally it is a tool of transcendence and a tool of hope for a better world for all of us that's so lovely you said that but you killed the conversation in the process because when you say something that is a tool of transcendence that it it transcends even truth itself then even kartik has nothing to say to that perhaps i'm wrong <laughs> you will be wrong you always fight <laughs> kartik bring it on bring it on kartik I, I, I agree. I mean, there's nothing to bring bring on. I mean, I I I want to also re. I mean, I guess two responses. One is, for me, art is re- more than more than more than activity of doing something. It's it's really a way of seeing. And when you said science, um, that that brought to mind this very notion that ev- like this very Sufi notion called. Uh, this notion that there are basically three big signs of god in the world we call ayat and the ayat is the sun uh, that is your own heart the heavens above which is the air the language the quran or the by the, the word for or the revelation and um and, and, and so i the, what i'm trying to get at is looking at these things as signs of ultimate reality that that word sign is a very beautiful word and a very very important word for me because it's it's that word where i i try to but i try to look at reality artistically but i try to look at reality as something that requires interpretation but i look at every little thing as something that is pointing to something be beyond itself where i look at every little thing as something that deserves my attention i think that's art for me ultimately so i i profoundly agree so i have nothing to to disagree with hmm something that deserves our attention something that deserves our attention it's curious they say an entertainer is a person who holds attention because to entertain is to hold attention there was also the idea of entrainment when a i know entrainment usually is is prescribed or used in another in other context but when you talk about attention that attention just becomes aware of itself so when that happens collectively when people start bringing their attention together actually is one of those moments where you have very very strong metaphysical or esoteric potential because you're actually just playing in awareness and belief which is curious you know so do you think that in that sense it is the artists which are ultimately the magicians the sorcerers or maybe use the word um, shamans nowadays which kind of have that mission to entrain to play with that attention and to make us understand what is worth our appreciation or not i know the poets for sure have to do that but but you know i've heard that poetry is something passé does anybody want to prove me wrong i don't know about proving you wrong but maybe proving you right <laughs> i think it happens naturally as an aspect of uh performance and and flow state and i think there's a, an upgrade uh, of intentionality that can be integrated such that musicians know that their wizards know that their shamans know that their healers and are doing that work with intention and and uh, kind of a guided sense into stepping into those roles um within uh regenerative ecosystems and and organizational structures and so it's this kind of uh 
interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary movement of the musician seeing musician as process for own self healing, then maybe process for collective healing or group healing or community healing that's been commoditized right, um, for consumption, and then that kind of stepping. Uh, out of that or into a new mask or into a new costume or into a new role um, that uh, can do that dance. Uh, sort of a sage movement. Hmm. I think of it as very similar to what Turquoise said. You know, that sage movement for me is how do you go from being a speculator to a believer? What is that process of conversion? Is it sudden? Is it long term? Karthik and I were talking about prayer as possibly the answer to this problem to go from speculation to believer. And I think artists play that role of converting through the encounter, a sacred encounter. You design that encounter to to be that feather, to be that that conversion moment I love what we just touched upon from the skeptic to the believer <laughs> we're on to something here not skeptic alone speculator a speculator is is like there is something in there but I my logical brain refuses to accept it Let's see how things pan out. Speculator. Like in the sense of... Yeah, that... Sorry, go ahead, Turquoise. I was just... That that idea of speculator and and participatory process of embodiment is what I'm asking about how that process, how that conversion happens. And what was coming up for me is the participatory learning of co-creation. So participating with the musician or with the artist in some aspect in group that kind of transforms your body through somatic experience whether that's dance or singing or um, arching along with the artist there's like a with and through that can happen I think that transforms us in ways that the cognitive aspect of um, uh, digestion or whatever cognitively grokking and experience isn't the same as spiritually or embodied or somatic or any of those things. And I think that lands a little stronger um, and transitions us. So that's a, that's a little piece that's coming up for me as part of the process. It turns out that there are two ways you can transform, immediate or slowly, of your own determination to transform or of complete surrender. And it turns out that this is a space that I would like to understand and study deeply. Well, that's a curious one. You know, I really like this idea of, uh, of a speculator, a person who holds his hands up in reverence but doesn't know of the energy that has to flow because of his belief, or a person who sings the Psalms, you know, just to make sure that everybody sees their lips swaying you know, so they see that they are part of the pantomime rather than actually really understanding the role they have to play in that cosmic moment. I like this one. I really like it. I think it's a it's a really deep one. And especially when I look at so much emergent shamanism right now, which is just that. Lips moving, arms swaying, people dressing with the right clothes, but not really understanding the work or just the attention or just the reverence that has to accompany it. That's a good one. How would you synthesize that, Raghava, one more time before we go off the air? I'm going to end, just before we go off the air, I'm going to say something I was sharing with Karthik. Both of us, are, I've discovered prayer recently, and I used to first pray to God saying, God, take care of me. I've been a good guy. I've done all these things. Help me, help me, help me. That evolved to, God, give me what I deserve. Forget it. Just give me what I deserve. And now it has evolved to, God, 
Let me follow your will. I have no destination. And I think there's something in surrender. Wait, wait, I have to interrupt you because we're off the air in three, two, one, ladies and gentlemen. That was Rianco Radio. Thank you for joining us. And if you want to hear the rest of what Ragava KK has to say, you can join us on Clubhouse or on the podcast, which will be recorded later. Thank you. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Sorry. Wow, you're amazing. I'm done. That's it. That was it. I just wanted to share the evolution of my prayer. The evolution of your prayer is a lovely one. You know I love these moments of synthesis So if we were to take and digest it correctly We move from a moment where we ask Because we're good guys, we're nice people, we're good girls We're not that crap human beings, right? And then we ask for what we deserve That's right, and so And now we ask for what we deserve what we think we deserve because how can a person even know what he is deserving of and the third stage then ragava tell us the third stage then is what share it with us one more time <laughs>